So I'm here with another uh, fun discussion uh, for a new book. It's going to be a lot of fun to dive into this and just scratch the surface probably uh, with Professor Peter John Barber. He's got a Ph.D. in religious studies, and he is quite a, a student and fan and researcher of Rene Girard and mimetic theory and application to that field of religious studies. So welcome to the program. Thanks for having me, David. Thanks for having me. So you join us uh, from British Columbia right now, right? That's right. Vancouver Island. Yeah. And you were born and raised there, or did you go around different places? Yeah, well, I've been around. So, um, well, in Canada, but it's a big country. So I, I was born on what they call the Sunshine Coast, a town called Seashelt, but it's not far from here. And um, my my parents were Salvation Army officers when I was young. And um, I, I don't know if you know about what they do, but it's not unlike the military where you every few years you're given a new assignment. And so uh, I guess it's part of the Army um, aspect of that. So I, we, we, we moved around different uh, places in Ontario before moving back to the West Coast here again. And um, I spent five years in Calgary after high school studying there, a place called, well, it's called Ambrose University now. And uh, yeah, went back and studied at UBC uh, when I was starting a family. And I was there from, and as I was just mentioning to you, that was about the time when I first encountered Gerard and that and uh, his thought with the- What year was that? Uh, 2007. Okay. Yeah. And, yeah. And I went and I went back to to university 2008 and uh, been on the uh, track of applying Gerard's thought. And Jesus and myth is just the latest uh, uh, the latest product of of that thinking and that research and writing. Well, um, do you have any other books that you've published on Gerard before this one, or is this? No. This, so this was my PhD dissertation, and I'm thankful it got picked up by Whip and Stock as a Pickwick imprint. Um, and so it's my first, yeah, published work. Uh, on Very Gerard. good. Yeah. Well, I have it here, and I want to promote it, Jesus in Myth, for our audience on video. You can check it out in audio. Check out Jesus in Myth by Peter John Barber. I just picked it up, and first I listened to some of your YouTube videos where you kind of giving a summary of the argument. And then I, I, I'm just now cracking the book. So I'm excited to kind of dive in still uh, fresh and, and new into this uh, argument you're making. But I think I have a general idea of what you're doing, which is very important because I think what you're, you're and, and I'll, I'll let you sum it up better than me, but it looks like you're juxtaposing the question of mythology is the biblical text just another piece of myth or can we systematically uh you know organize the text and see that perhaps it's it's not just myth it's also a challenge to myth is that right yeah i, th I think that's fair yeah um the so the book addresses the claim that jesus and gospel accounts are mythological to some extent and, and yeah, th th there's a line that uh, David Cayley uses in an interview with Gerard in that interview called The Scapegoat uh, from 2001. And Cayley summarizes what Gerard does or what Gerard observes Jesus doing in the gospel accounts, which is a redemptive return to the pattern of myth as well as its overcoming. So the idea there, and that's that sort of principle that is, is what I run with in this book, which is that... Um, you can find myth in the gospel accounts in a Girardian sense, not, not in the sense that it's not historical or that it's not, or, or that it's um, descended from or related to um, other mythologies, but in the sense that um, everyone around Jesus is engaged in what Gerard describes in various ways, uh, such as uh, the, the collective delusion of, um, of, the sacred of, of scapegoating culture. Um, and everyone is, is, is a nerd in that, in that um, worldview, except Jesus, <laughs> right. Jesus, en Jesus enters into the world, but he's not of the world. And um, he, he, he systematically, I say in the book, he systematically uh, subverts and inverts the pattern of myth. So that that's why the subtitle is the gospel accounts, two patterns that you have, two patterns in the gospel accounts, um, 
the, the pattern of myth or myth culture uh, that Gerard um, observes and details for us in his work, uh, at the heart of which is the scapegoat. But then there's Jesus pattern, which is, which is transcendent, which is unique and, and completely different from the pattern of myth. And, and Jesus exposes myth's pattern in, in the gospel accounts. Yeah, so that's what we want to kind of uh, unpack a little bit today is that, you know, there's a, well, is, is the idea that the Gospels are myth, that's not really a dominant uh, view in academia, is it? They, they would say more, no, it's not myth, it's more like just, uh, you know, proselytizing and some kind of, you know, religious, um, you know, text that's trying to sell you on something that they're delusional about or something, right? I mean, how would you explain what's the, what's the academic well, treatment of the text? Yeah. Um, there, there, there's a book by a fellow named uh, Dennis McDonald, I think, um, called Mythologizing Jesus, came out a few years ago, where he, I think he articulates what is a, the popular view uh, in the mainstream academy and mainstream culture, which is that yeah, there's, there's an historical Jesus, there's an historical kernel of this, this man who lived, uh, this Jew who, um, you know, was, was a good man and, and had wise sayings and some good advice. And then on top of that, there were these like almost geologic layers or accretions of, of fiction that his followers added later, um, mythologizing him and, and sort of drumming him up to be like um, these other gods that we in, in encounter in mythology. And so you have to like dig through those layers of mythologization to, to get to the historical Jesus. I think that's, I, I think that's a fair summary of the way that um, the gospels and Jesus are typically approached. And, and I'm, I, I'm taking issue with that in the book and claiming that, um, well, first of all, I said about defining myth, um, and, and, and my whole aim of the book is to demonstrate that Jesus um, fails to conform to the category of myth. And so right. I start by, I, I start by defining myth as, or yeah, by, by isolating the, the combat myth, which is considered the arch myth type. This is the hero pattern, you know, the, uh, the pattern of the hero versus the villain or monster God, um, cosmos versus chaos. And, uh, Various scholars have have laid down, or yeah, laid down the the typical pattern. So works like um, the the work of Vladimir Prop in his Morphology of the Folktale, uh, the work of uh, Joseph Fontenrose in his book Python, um, and, and another work that I that I make use of is Neil Forsyth's The Old Enemy, um, and in in Forsyth's book he he really, I think, does a nice job building on the work of others like Prop and um, Fontenrose by identifying 12 typical motifs that occur in a typical sequence. And, and that, that's the pattern of the combat myth. And the combat myth is the arch myth, and we find it in tribes and cultures all over the world uh, throughout the millennia. And yet it has a, a typical um, sequence of motifs these 12 motifs and would you dis, would, would you just dis, would you distinguish the combat myth structure from like legends and folk tales like you mentioned and those types of things or would you just say those are more uh, more recent versions of the combat myths which is the more ancient form of this same structure yeah that, that's a good question I, I i would take gerard's position on these things which is you know he he says that what we encounter in these myths uh, because each one of these combat myths has at its heart a scapegoating event, which is described as the hero's defeat of the, the villain or the monster god and the restoration of cosmos based on that murder, which is veiled as a great victory. And um, Gerard says that these need to be understood, like he says in his book, The Scapegoat, as witch hunting texts, that we need to, we, we need to, we need to observe that just as witch hunting texts are lies told by the the lynch mob or the majority about this person or this minority group that was falsely accused of being the cause of all our troubles. And if we just get rid of that person or that group, then we can restore order and 
and that combat myths or that, yeah, the, the, these myths are of the same, that they're engaged in the same um, deception. And, uh, and, and so that's what Jesus is doing. So, so, on, so that in, in Jesus and myth, I call that, that aspect of the study, the, the combat myth itself, the narratological aspect. But then I, I, I look at it from another angle, which is a social scientific aspect. And I, I use what Gerard, so Gerard usually speaks about the pattern, which is cyclical and recurs over and over again of, of myth and myth culture um, as chaos, scapegoat, cosmos, those three, and that goes round and round and round. But then he, he, he gets more specific and he actually just talks about six episodes um, so that chaos is made up of uh, sameness or this non-differentiation, a breakdown of distinctions, and which gives rise to scandal, right? And then um, the scapegoat event it consists of a, a escalation, a mimetic es escalation of this resentment that leads to the scapegoating event itself. And then cosmos is restored, order is restored through satiation, which is where the group collectively devours or benefits from the from the death of the scapegoat and then segregation or the restoration of cosmos occurs. So I, 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 I take Gerard's insights and I more systematically um, present them, both the 12 motifs of combat myth, which I think map on perfectly onto those six episodes uh, that, that, so cultures imitate their stories and their stories describe their behavior. So you have those two things are really two different. So the combat myth and that what I just laid out there that Gerard describes are two ways of describing the same phenomenon. And then I, I say, this is myth. This is the pattern of myth. Now let's test and see if Jesus conforms to this pattern or not in the gospel accounts. And, and we find that he, he inverts the order and subverts the meaning of each motif in each episode all the way along the way, disclosing it and, um, and rendering it obsolete. Through, through his pattern, which he lives out and, and teaches. Now, what about like um, ancient descriptions of battles, like in the Old Testament? How do they stack up against? I know, I know that's not the, I know that's not the, you know, the, 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 the focus of this book that you've put here. But just coming to mind, I'm trying to categorize this stuff too when you see uh, the story of David and Goliath, does that fit into a combat myth or is there something different about that? For example. Uh, so, so <laughs> yeah, my, um, so I, I think there are a few questions in there. Um, and I'm not sure which ones you want me to address, but uh, so I'll, so on, on, on the one hand, in my opinion, the, the scriptures are historical. So I, so the, the, the kind of analysis I'm engaging in is not so much um, are there are there accounts in scripture that are not historical. Um, I I take that for granted and I set that aside at the outset of Jesus and myth and I focus on the fact that myths have a, a discernible pattern of events with certain meanings, and if Jesus were mythological, he will conform to that. Um, so it's more social scientific in terms of social behavior and the significance of acts performed than it is about, you know, is, is this fantasy or is it history? I'm not sure if that's what you were, what you were driving at there, but. Um, well, I'm just, I'm just trying to, I was just thinking like, you know, when it's, when I look at Beowulf, the story of Beowulf, right? Because right? you're talking about there's two gods, a hero God and a monster God. So look right. at Beowulf, that fits that. You've got Beowulf, Beowulf the legend, and he's fighting Grendel, this troll monster. So that looks yeah. like a legend, which is a little bit, it's still got the combat myth structure that you just alluded to. Sure. You look at King David and Goliath, you have a monster, a nine-foot guy. Was he a scapegoat? You know, was it more of a, you know, a nuanced discussion than it really looks like in the text, or is... Is that yeah. more like a, just an accurate historical? There's no otherizing of 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 the opponent as the monster god, so to speak. Yeah, that, that's a good that's a good question. Um, so I, I I I would not consider the David and Goliath combat as a combat myth. It in 
in terms of David's nar um, historical narrative, the, the, the mythological opponent for David, I, I would say is Saul. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there you have, there you have the, this, what I call the sameness, Dre use the term sameness too for that, that baseline of, um, um, borrowed desire gone haywire where, where, and this often happens in relation in hierarchical relationships. That's where the distinction uh, collapses into a rivalry of two contenders for, but, but David's a good example of a, of a Christ figure because he doesn't respond in the mythological way to Saul's envy and resentment and, and just rage over David's, he, he perceives David as a, as a potential rival for his crown, right? And that's, that's a mythological mentality. That's, you know, um, like Isaiah says of, of uh, Lucifer's desire that he, he wished to make himself above the most high, right? And that's what he tempted Adam and Eve with, you'll, you'll be like gods. And so that, that desire to um, um, best and best your rival and replace and take his being, his position, his authority and everything that goes with it. Saul fears David because he perceives him as someone who's attempting to do that. But David, that is not David's heart. That's not his desire. And he never openly grasps at Saul's position. He always honors uh, Saul's authority and he waits for God's timing to give, because God had promised him the throne of Israel, right? But, um, but he, never, he never seizes it. He always waits for that. So, so you have the two patterns between David and Saul. But in terms of Goliath, I think Goliath is just, uh, you know, the Philistines were a thorn in the side of Israel for centuries. And I think that's just an historical, um, yeah, situation that ancient Israel faced in terms of its, its enemies round about it. Yeah. So, so uh, when we look at, you, you focus on the gospel of Mark, right? In the, in the book? Yeah, so... <laughs> Yeah, an earlier iteration of the dissertation tried to to deal with all four gospels to some extent, um, and it was my my wise examiners who limited me to just just doing Mark, and I think that was right. And so, yeah, I, I, I starting at verse sort starting at the fifth chapter, I go through, I I dedicate a chapter to each of the six episodes. So in each, so from chapter five on to chapter eleven, I guess or 10, sorry, I, I go through the six episodes of these two patterns running concurrently through the gospel of Mark verse by verse in order to demonstrate that, you know, what, once, once I've established in the methodology that there are these six patterns, or sorry, six episodes in the pattern of myth, each episode made up of two motifs because the combat myth motifs map right onto those six episodes that you look at from the science, social scientific aspect. Then, then, it, then, the, the, then the issue becomes identifying if and where those occur in the gospel account and then um, scrutinizing the text to see if Jesus is following that sequence of events with those meanings that you have in myth, either as the hero or the villain, um, or, or not. And, that, and that's the sort of the systematic scientific test of whether Jesus is conforming to the, to the pattern of myth so I believe it, it was a, it was a successful um, demonstration that Jesus um, fails to conform to the pattern of myth that he alone is not mythological, based on those criteria that I set out at the outset. And uh, when you say he alone is not mythological, he alone in the context of all the characters in the story of the Gospel of Mark, or right, right. So yeah, exactly. Um, it's interesting because you find that, so for example, in the, in the first episode, when Jesus appears on the scene in, in, in Mark's account, the, 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 the first two motifs you expect in what I call the, the, the sameness distinction episode. So what, what I did in the book is I, I alliterate the, the terms for the episodes for e ease of uh, recall. So the six episodes I call sameness, scandal, Snare striving, scapegoat, uh, satiation, and segregation. Just words that try and capture the Girardian sense of the meaning of these episodes as they progress through the pattern. 
But Jesus, I, I assert he's got his own pattern, which is uh, distinction, diffusion, deference, deliverance, dispersive display, and finally deification. And that's not his deification. It's, it's the deification of his, belief, of his followers when they become believers and, and then participate in the divine nature um, through faith in Jesus. Uh, that, that you read about at the end of the gospel account. But in the first episode, the first two motifs you expect from what we read in the combat myth are lack villainy, and then hero emerges. That's consistently the, the, the two first motifs in that order and with that meaning in, you know, th there are two myths in particular that I lay out as examples before I even get into the gospel accounts. Uh, Marduk versus Tiamat from ancient Babylon and Zeus versus Typhon from ancient Greece. So I work with those two as examples. First, you have a situation of lack or villainy. There's something that's, that's um, missing or needed desperately that, that the community doesn't have. Or there's this potential, there's this villain who comes on the scene that needs to be dealt with that threatens the life and existence of, of the community. And then, the, then, and then a hero emerges to deal with that. And that'll be either closely related to the, the main hero of the account. Um, so in the Marduk Tiamat, it's, it's Marduk's father, Ap, uh, not Apsu, Marduk's father, Ea, or Nudimud, he's called. And then he'll, he'll set up Marduk to be the main hero. And then the Zeus Typhon myth, it's Zeus who emerges in the second position. But the interesting thing about the gospel accounts is when you say, okay, that's what I expect to find if Jesus is mythological, there's going to be a situation of lack or villainy. And then if Jesus is the hero, he's going to emerge in second position to deal with that. But what happens in Mark, and I think in all the gospel accounts, the first thing you encounter is the reverse. You have Jesus emerge immediately as the hero, and he's not... He's not just a hero in the mythological sense, you know, the heroes of myth. It's not clear whether they're going to be victorious yet. Um, they're going to establish that through what they achieve. But Jesus is immediately identified in Mark as the Lord God of the, the, the Bible, the Old Testament. He, he comes to fulfill these prophecies of the coming of, of the Messiah, the Lord. And uh, John the Baptist, his forerunner, his herald comes before him. And then secondly, you have lack villainy. And, and, and that is, you know, Jesus in the wilderness. Um, Satan appears to tempt him. And um, John is thrown in prison. Um, and so that situation of lack and villainy there comes in second position, the gospel accounts for Jesus. And so it's interesting to think about it the other way, which is to say, um, who actually appears where the mythological hero is expected to appear? Satan, right? And, 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 and the opponents of Jesus are those who you find follow myths pattern in the expected order with the expected meaning. But Jesus is constantly upending, he's inverting and the, the order and he's subverting the meaning of myths pattern. He doesn't conform. And um, that makes Jesus unique and distinct from the pattern of myth. So when you are looking in those characters, they're um, Jewish, so they, they're not going to be influenced by pagan myths, but yet they still follow the mythic pattern of, of choices, right? Can you explain how that works? Yeah, that, and that was, a fascinating, that was something I wrestled with when I was researching and writing the book, because on the one hand, like you say, Israel is already a distinct culture from every other tribe and, and you know, they're... By, by definition, Israel is not, um, like you could say on paper, it's not mythological, right? But Israel struggles because it received the law from God on Mount Sinai, and it, it has a relationship with God, and it's, it's, Israel is chosen to be an instrument through which um, the truth is given to the world and that the nations can approach God through Israel. That's part of their mandate and their purpose. But Throughout Israel's history, they struggle with syncretism. They're, all, they're, they're always falling into, as soon as they enter the land of Canaan, you know, well, even before in the wilderness, but when they, when they enter uh, the land of Canaan, they are constantly tempted to worship the gods of the people around them. And, um, and so you find that, yeah, it's interesting in, in the gospel account, the first century AD, Israel, its, its leadership are 
and, and even Jesus' own disciples, you know, their, their expectations for their Messiah to come is that he will come as a conquering hero who will just, um, you know, bash all their enemies and establish this perfect kingdom. And in some ways, yeah, that, that, that's what the prophets foretold about the Messiah. And there are, you know, there are prophecies about the Messiah coming and putting down all Israel's enemies and establishing this kingdom for Israel. Um, and uh, Jesus' disciples expect him to, to behave in that way. And, you know, even when he's going up to the cross um, at what's called the triumphal entry, and all the people are coming to him with their palm branches, and he's being feted as a conquering hero on his way into Jerusalem. Um, yeah, th th that just symbolizes the people's misunderstanding of the Messiah's first coming. Jesus has to explain to his disciples several times, and I think he says it three or four times on the way to the cross in Mark's gospel account. The Son of Man will be betrayed, and he'll go just as the prophets foretold, um, he'll be betrayed into the hands of sinners and be crucified and uh, rise from the dead the third day. And when, when he first tells his disciples that in Mark chapter 8, Apo um, Apostle Peter takes him aside to rebuke him, right? And it's at that famous encounter when Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Um, because Jesus is not going to walk in the pattern of myth. And it's interesting that... Um, even Israel and even the leadership of Israel have an expectation for Jesus. Um, yeah, that's, that's essentially as mythological as, as what all the cultures around them expect of their gods to do. So that when Jesus is on the cross, they say to him, you know, if you were the son of God, you would come down and defeat your enemies. Right. And, uh, and they, they don't understand what Jesus is doing, even though everything he's doing is prophesied beforehand. Uh, for example, Psalm 22, right? Famous crucifixion psalm um, there, or, or Isaiah 53. Um, and, and they're just not, yeah, they, 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 they don't see the pattern that Jesus is walking and they don't want it. They, they want him to behave like Zeus or Marduk or one of these people. And, and, and to put that into context for our time, the, the mythic way that they want him to behave is really the political way which we still want today. Right. And that's the idea of power makes right. Might makes right. You know, lording yeah. over people. Uh, and, and, and all of this happens, you know, uh, because Peter, you know, like you said, Peter's telling him, don't, you know, you can't do it that way. And he says, get behind me accuser. You're accusing me of being like what you want me to do, which is ultimately to be a revolutionary, like a William Wallace. That's why William Wallace the Braveheart yeah. movie was such a great hit for people because people like the idea of an underdog fighting for his people and using force and using power to beat them and, re and to reciprocate their insult with uh, stronger force, right? And that's just not what you see in the Jesus story, do we? Right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. And, and the fact that Jesus calls his disciples to take up their cross and follow him is 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 genuinely a call to suffering that um <laughs> it's not it's not what we're looking for from our gods <laughs> uh so yeah right. it's 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 upside down from 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 our desires and expectations isn't it yeah yeah even to this day i try to tell people about jesus in a political context and even christians will tell me no we need constantine not jesus applied here you know and i'm thinking wait what right. What happened here, you know, but that's what happens with uh, people yeah. who feel they feel backed up against the wall. But, you know, I tell people that's what most of human history has been. Most of human history has been a marauding uh, group of uh, warriors coming by your village and doing horrible things or some lord ruling over your village or protecting you from them or some, you know, and maybe they weren't as uh, insufferable as our nanny state uh warlords today but uh they they certainly would do whatever they could to to take that which they wanted from you and you didn't really have much say over the matter and being treated like a second class citizen and not being yeah. able to eat at the table these were things that were just commonplace realities for much of human history around the world yeah and they're becoming so more and more again in our day right yeah. 
yeah yeah it's interesting to um yeah no, uh, i was enjoying some of your your recent interviews on this whole situation we're facing as a as a as a human race i guess it's so it's it's a global situation that we face where people are volunteer voluntarily rolling back the clock on all the work that was done and all all the sacrifices that were made uh in 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 the christian world i think we can fairly say in 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 the west to establish um individual uh sovereignty national democracy um and and the, the the respect and the value of the individual that that really the gospel and the cross give us um instead of the the mentality of constant sacrifice of the other to like those um <laughs> marauding kings and and the the idolization of the um the hero who who yeah, sacrifices the other. Instead of that perspective, Jesus gives us an upside down um, view of what is most valuable. And, and it's those values that are the heart of Western democracies. And we're, we're voluntarily throwing that off out of fear and saying, you can take all our rights and freedoms and all, all the, the respect of the individual, just keep me safe from this virus or, or whatever the threat may be. And it's, I, I think it's a return to a to a mythological world, a, a, a myth culture again. I mean, I'm not saying we were ever fully stripped of that of that problem that I think is always in us. But I, I think a, a lot of systems were put in place under the influence of Christianity that are that are dissolving right now rapidly. But at the same time, I don't think it'll last or succeed as previous incarnations of these uh, domination matrix type structures that the world has been under before Jesus arrived and then after Jesus arrived because we're slow to listen to his alternative path. Uh, I don't think it'll last because Jesus sets this stumbling block for the world called the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And it's this inversion of the unity that's created through sacrifice. Now sacrifice creates schism. And that's exactly what we see. The more the more the population perceives certain policies as heavy-handed and oppressive and scapegoating in an unjust way, the more people who were on the sidelines or indifferent start to have sympathy and somewhat solidarity with the people who were perceived to be unjustly persecuted. Of course, the yeah. media operates in real time as a kind of real-time myth-making apparatus, which is trying to constantly tell stories to the general population as to why this power is justified in excluding or demonizing or otherizing their current target of the month or whatever it is. So they're, they're constant. It's like a rat race. You know, you've got this undermining. You've got this escalation of, the, the schismatic nature of scapegoating that Jesus set up in history for these tyrants. And then you have the, the priestly cast in the mediators of the media busy writing myths in real time every day, trying to create the false reality that no, 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 it's okay to exclude them from restaurants or grocery stores. If they don't take a product, it's okay. You can do that. They're killing you. They're monsters, you know? And so they're constantly <laughs> trying yeah. to create this, in real time, ad hoc, continual myth that's orated to them every day, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, and 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 like you say, I, I I I don't believe either that they'll succeed in creating that unanimity you need to to really have the I guess what Jared calls the the catharsis, the that sense of peace that comes about at peace as the world gives it, as Jesus says in John. 14 through through sacrifice it it's it's never gonna you're you're never gonna reestablish that that mythological unanimity because like you say that there's i mean it, this is our hope but i think we observe it too is that there are enough people uh like the disciples after the resurrection who who were now aware of the truth and like gerard says in his in, in his work that you know the Holy Spirit in the world, in the hearts of people, um, has an like he's he's the uh, like Gerard points out he's the Paraclete he's the advocate for the defense he 
he stands against the accuser that wants to establish that unanimity around the scapegoat that's needed for this world, this world peace that, that comes about through scapegoating. And there's, there's this force in the world against it now, which constantly undermines that unanimous consent that you need to, and, and, and yet on the other hand, you, you can point to examples where there seems to have been some limited success in there. There's, I mean, the atrocities of the 20th century against certain groups <laughs> were obviously temporary and, um, um, I don't even know if you could say they're isolated. Um, regionalized, so maybe, right? <laughs> regionalized. Uh, but, but, but they don't last. And um, yeah, the hope is that there are enough people who, who will not be duped, who will not be deceived by the lie, um, and, and, and who will stand with the victim, who, who will stand against that, um, yeah, that, those stereotypes of persecution. And building on Gerard's work with the idea of different texts being different, um, almost like fossil records of human understanding about myth, you know, the idea that different texts in history almost serve like a fossil record of human understanding of their own scapegoating tendencies and how there's a relationship that Gerard identifies in um in technology advancing in christianity advancing right all right so my my point is is that so gerard makes a few interesting insights about how media plays a role in unraveling the power of myth and yeah. i call this the gospel technology in the sense that you can use media to bear witness to the innocence of victims and expose myth and its power structures of violence in real time. And that right. it doesn't mean you're going to solve the problem immediately, but that it creates an impact in the culture that starts to soften their resolve to continue doing that type of act of violence. And so when I look at media, and I look at the 20th century media, and I look at the 21st century media, I see an evolution of media technology that goes hand in hand with gospel infection and concern for victims. So when I look at the 20th century, I'm not saying it's impossible for it to happen, but I feel like the media context has decentralized the powerful in their ability. It has decentralized uh, media so that it's harder to create the kind of myth needed to execute millions of people in mass in Western countries. I'm not saying, I don't want to be saying it's not possible. I want to be clear about that, but I find it much harder because I feel like the evolving media structures that we have developed where everybody has access to an HD live stream phone in Afghanistan, you know, when you have this kind of hyper decentralized sense making apparatus in the form of media technology, it breaks apart the ability to create these grand myths that can sell people on killing millions of people in horrible ways, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I, I think that's like, yeah, there, there's a saying that Gerard has about that, um, about the influence of the gospel in terms of the rise of, uh, science and, and technology and um, reason and the ability to um, stand against that that um, contagious lie that that's needed to get people to to go along with with scapegoating and uh, and I'm probably going to butcher it but it's something like we didn't um, um, stop burning witches because we invented science. We invented science because we stopped burning witches or something like that. Right. Right. Just to say that this, this revelation that begins with the gospel and the cross um, is actually the, the, the basis for the demythologization of human culture and enables people to get an outside view of, uh, of our tendency to unite around, a victim and, and, and falsely lay all of our 
our own problems on this one person or group and then pretend that getting rid of that person or group will solve our problems all of that that deception and that that solution which is not a solution so it has to be repeated all the time that 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 lie that is religion that is the sacred is is undermined by the cross and and by the christian message and leads to well if we're if if <laughs> If the problems we face or that we potentially face are not caused by, you know, the, the God's anger at us for not dealing with this evil person, um, then we have to find a rational explanation. We have to turn to, to scientific method and to discovering what's actually going on here is it's, it, it's not this, um, well, I'll, I'll use the word pagan. It's not this pagan or... Uh, um, delusion of, of combat myths, but it's, um, you know, it's not the fault of this, this uh, ugly or weird looking or sounding person. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, there's something else going on. And, and so like in this situation with China virus, we're being told most recently, I saw this morning that here in Canada, here in the province of BC, actually, we we're being told that well, first off, the, the powers that be were celebrating that so many had been vaccinated, but, they, but then they said the unvaccinated, that's the scapegoat group, the unvaccinated are, um, they're, they're the typhoid Marys who are continuing to infect the population and we need to find a way to, to force them to be vaccinated against their will by strong arming them with different, taking away different rights and freedoms um, to get them to do that, whereas in fact, there was an article in the Lancet, I think, um, where um, some researchers discovered that those who have been vaccinated <clears throat> are the are they're, they're the typhoid marys because they're producing these variants, like the Delta variant, and then and then they're they're the, going around and spreading these variants uh, because these these vaccines that were developed are they were developed under emergency orders, they, they weren't properly um, founded on an isolation of the actual China virus. And so they, they can't deal with it fully. And so you get um, uh, a, a, a subset of the virus survives, which is um, able to overcome the vaccine and the problem gets worse. So it's those who are vaccinated. So, so here's an example where, where uh, science um, like proper science is is dispelling the lie of 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 the scapegoat that you know it's not these unvaccinated people. There's something else going on, and and but but the popular narrative and and the, the powers that be who are interested in control of the people and unanimity uh, against their victim. They're they're not going to look at the science. They're, they're because to and it's because they have but there's a rain there's reigning gods that they are trying to keep alive in the myth and the reigning God is we're moderns. We know science. We know technology. We can master nature. Right. We can beat nature. If a pandemic comes, we can come up with a prophylactic product in the midst of a pandemic and somehow that will solve it. And when it doesn't solve it, as science would suggest, and many scientists have warned that a preventative vaccine introduced in the midst of a pandemic will only accelerate vaccine escape you know the the uh, like you were talking right. about the antibody dependent um you know uh the uh, resistance where you have basically they're overcoming it because they develop the technology to only target the uh spike protein part of the whole virus not it wasn't designed right. against the whole virus and so all these variants are are variations on the spike protein part of the virus this is exactly yeah. where all the pressure has been put evolutionarily for these viruses to overcome. So it's like you've got one pick for a lock, and then someone blocks that particular pick. They just modify the pick, and now they can open the door again. And that's right. what's happened. You accelerated that that development by putting pressure selectively on that one part of the of the virus. So you're right, but you're but but they have to prop up their gods. The myth is we are moderns. We are the tower of Babel. You know, they don't say it that way, but that's what they're basically saying. We can conquer the world. We can conquer 
the boundaries of gender. We can conquer the boundaries of, of scarcity. You know, we can yeah. conquer the boundaries of outcomes. We don't like it that, you know, 70, 80% of engineering graduates are, are men. So we can conquer that. We can make it 70% women now just to get revenge on the men for getting all the engineering degrees in the past. This is a kind of insanity that Gerard predicted in his own work. And the right. Bible, more importantly, predicts, right, is that mother will be against father, father will be against brother. You know, this whole idea that when you break away the scapegoat mechanism, but you don't repent of collective violence, all it leads to is never-ending undifferentiation and chaos, right? Right, right. Yeah, it's, it's a terrifying prospect, isn't it? Um, yeah, wow. But, that, that, that's a big picture. Does that mean that, uh, do you believe that Jesus will not succeed in history? Uh, <laughs> As his project failed, he gave it a good shot. We we did a couple good things with it, but we mostly failed miserably as the human species. And, and now he's going to have to pick up the pieces like the Afghanistan well, war ending, and he's going to evacuate. <laughs> uh, well, you know, um, the, 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 this would branch out into another subject entirely, but I, I, I believe another thing the scriptures reveal to us is that uh, times are in the hands of the creator, uh, of, of the Lord, and there have been various stages throughout history where humanity has failed, uh, failed to operate individually and collectively according to God's expectations. And um, most recently, um, in terms of this, this paradigm, is Israel's failure to accept their Messiah and and the the coming of the Holy Spirit? Speaking of the the biblical progression of events that you read about there, in the Gospel accounts, um, Jesus is called a blasphemer by the leaders of Israel because they're like our powers today. They're trying to protect their authority. It's not even about whether the Messiah has come or not, but whether this guy is going to support our authority, our our their control or not. And he doesn't bend the knee to them. And so they say, well, no, you can't be the Messiah, but you must have a demon. And his response is, okay, you can blaspheme the son of man, me, and it'll be forgiven you. But if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, it won't be forgiven you. It won't be forgiven this generation. And Jesus prophesies that that generation of Israel will be destroyed because they re didn't recognize the time of their visitation, right? The, the Messiah came to them as foretold and they crucified him right that stone rejected that you're talking about and um he became the chief of the corner but israel what happened to them right they they, they got wiped from the land uh and spent two thousand years in exile just until the last century so just to say that israel's time and ministry and purpose came to an end as a nation because they failed um collectively and their, their leadership level failed, deceiving the people. And I, I, I think Christianity will face such a day where Christian, you know, the, the body of Christ, which, which was instituted after or at the time of the fall of Israel, read about the book of Acts and the, the letters of Paul, who articulates that. It, it has a purpose to fulfill, which involves some of the things we're talking about, um, you know, speaking the truth of the gospel into into the darkness and, and the deceptions of the world. And it may be that, and I think Paul describes a time when they will no longer endure sound doctrine, but will be led astray by various um, deceptions. And like Israel before us, the body of Christ will fail. But, and, and I think the scriptures describe events that follow that. And so I I'm 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 a person who who reads the tries to read the Bible plainly and the scriptures as interpreting themselves. And I think that's the basis for a scientific worldview, in fact. Like Isaac Newton, who was a Bible believer and is the father of modern science, you know. Um so I, I think the scriptures describe a future where the Lord Jesus does set up his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven, as Daniel and, and John in Revelation describe. Uh, but it doesn't doesn't occur before there's a whole lot of trouble on the face of the whole earth. Uh, you know that Jesus talks about in Mark's gospel and his Olivet discourse, the kind of he says that it'll be a time of tribulation such as uh, the world has never seen before and never will again. And maybe that relates to what you're talking about about 
you know, at this, this situation of all against all where, um, yeah, there's, there's no unanimity through the sacred. And yet at the same time, there's a general refusal to um, believe and choose this other way that's been provided for us. And there, what do you there, is, there is slow movement. It's just not fast enough, you know, because you've got, there's slow, the obviously, you know, the political correctness of the West is because of Christianity, right? This awareness of victims. It, right. It's a, it's a counterfeit imitation of the real thing, but it's still, even in its counterfeit nature, it's still rooted in something true, which is the revelation of, of, uh, of the oppressed, you know, that, that, that the lamb of God is the symbol of the underdog of the victim of history. And that's why the West is particularly sensitive to narratives that are cloaked in protecting the vulnerable, right? So the American government wants to sell their country on why we need to have Raytheon and Boeing make a killing off of Afghanistan for 20 years. They do so in the name of victims. We're going to help women. We're going to help the children, you know, and so you have to sell that kind of Christian infected myth to sell the violence because they wouldn't receive a message like we're going to go to Afghanistan because our, our economy is built on ammunitions and military industrial spending and we need to train people. We need to have a playground where we can bring in new recruits and train them on all the equipment. We need a place we can send bullets everywhere. We need a place where we can geopolitically check some of the powers we're worried about. And by the way, we'll get some of the loot if there's anything here we can make for our economy. Uh, not much, but there's a little bit. Uh, but, you know, that's so they don't they can't sell a war that way. They have to sell a war because we're a Christ haunted society. They have to sell it with. You know, just like with the desert storm, babies being yanked out of incubators. That was the justification to use the sword of myth in that situation. Right. It's yeah. always that way because we're Christ haunted. So that's a sign that Christ has had success in shaping humanity. Because yeah. to me, anytime Satan has to, in terms of the scapegoat mechanism, when the satanic system has to hide more and more cleverly like Jesus, it means he's on the run. It's, that's yeah. not a conquering here. That's not a conquering, uh, you know, Victor. Yeah. That's someone who's hiding under bushes and, you know, he's, oh, it's like Scooby-Doo. He's always got another mask on and you take it off. Oh, it's Satan again. But it's always looking like, hey, look, I'm just, it reminds me of that movie. I, I've said this before, Batman, the original Batman with Michael Keaton, where you have Joker and he's about to beat him. And then Joker puts on glasses and he says, you wouldn't hit a, hit a man with glasses, would you? You know, cause you wouldn't hurt me. Cause I can't, you know, I've got glasses on. He's trying to hide in a victim garbed attire. Right. To me, that sounds like Jesus is winning in history, even though he's got the sorriest team in the world to play with you know, on the court, <laughs> you know, the, the church yeah. in terms of its ability to do it right. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, I think, uh, yeah, I think Gerard talks about how the how the spirit is a he's a he's a check on he, he's a check on Satan for the ways you just described. He's a check on ourselves on our desire to scapegoat others because he he's always defending, um, yeah, the the false victim of our our self interest, right? And um, yeah, so there's yeah, as 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 long as the the spirit is at work. And the, the body of Christ is at work in the world. There will be this check, and the, yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. and Satan, Satan, the way his the system works is he it feeds off of, and this and we can relate it back to the book probably, but it's because I see some parallels. He feeds off of us not doing the Christian thing in previous episodes of our culture. So it's always a half truth of gospel, right? Because he you know, like the treatment of minorities in America, right? Segregation and treating people less than the, the, the lynchings and terrible things like that. That is a sin. And Satan says, I want to remind you of that sin over and over again because you weren't Christian, you know? And so therefore we have to overcorrect with always making everything about critical theory and everything's about, you know, uh, you know, White revenge, and reparations and so forth, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and that and, and there again, that that that's another uh, phenomenon that is, um, that is, 
described proleptically, I guess, in the gospel accounts when Jesus critiques the religious leaders of his day for building these monuments to the prophets that their fathers killed. Yeah. Right. So as I say, if, 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 if we lived in the days of our fathers, we wouldn't have persecuted them. You know, we are. It's just, so o- overcompensating for their father's sins, as you say, and yet and yet they're doing the same things. He says, you're going to you, <laughs> you're going to crucify me. And they say, who's trying to kill you? Meanwhile, they are scheming to kill him. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and yeah, like, yeah, that that. Yeah, you, you're right. I, I, I think you're right that that there's this throwing of our, our past sins in our face to, to undermine our, our, our genuine, that there, there are genuine positive developments that have come about through the influence of Christianity over the years. And it's, there's always, there's, there's a constant attempt to undermine or subvert or, or divert that progress with these. Yeah. And we always seem to be a step behind, right? It seems like we're always a step behind in realizing what's going on. Well, because we, because I think our awareness of victims is a little faster than our desire to repent of violence to solve the problem, right? That's the lag that I think is the deadly lag, right? Because we, we, we want, we, we should have reconciliation. We should recognize hurt and pain in communities and, and, and deal with that. We should be able to have that, but it's, we have it, but then we always get uh, swept up in, okay, let's pass a law. Let's make this, let's force, let's get revenge. Let's demonize somebody else's group to try to make things right. So that, right. but at the same time, we are, again, just to be positive about this, we are ev- evolving away from more brutal forms of violence on the whole because of the gospel. You know, like I say to people, in Jesus' time, they were, you know, not long, you know, they were doing gladiatorial games where they're ripping people limb to limb and lions were devouring them. Today we have football where it's simulated padded violence and we're worried about concussions. No one was worried about gladiators getting concussions when Jesus was walking the earth. You know, <laughs> nobody was worried about how gladiators treated their girlfriends like they're worried about domestic violence problems in the NFL. So we've come that that's Jesus's impact in history is softening our appetite for sacrificial violence. But it, that 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 uh, appetite is a little slower to to wane than our awareness of victims. You know. Yeah, yeah, and and, and there are new ways to hide and disguise that sacrifice and to obscure it um, behind various pretenses. Um, yeah, like another thing I saw in the last year here in Canada was uh, they finally put through a euthanasia uh, law uh, for, and it's not just for people who are suffering these terrible illnesses and are just, and there it seems like there's no way to give them various therapies to, to ease their passing or, or whatever, but anybody who feels depressed, you know, anybody who wants to uh, end it all, volunteer yourself for sacrifice uh yeah it's kind of an oedipal moment you know to tearing out his own eyes because that's what that's what the culture says is the right solution so well, it's wanna... a twist it's a twisting of that compassion into something evil again yeah. yeah yeah exactly yeah it's a it's a twisted time but it, i don't know it's i think the the future is open to how we end up landing this plane in history i don't know it can be I think there's an easy way and there's a harder way and there's a lot of different spectrum, uh, spectrum options in between. Um, I want to, I want to ask you about in your study of Mark, first of all, um, does, does Mark talk about the story of, uh, Herod being afraid that, um, John the Baptist has resurrected and is going to haunt him? Yes, he does. Yes, he does. Uh, yeah. When, when he hears about what Jesus is doing, his reaction is, Oh, that's John. Uh, who's who must have risen from the dead after he's had him beheaded, and uh, and Jesus has to go in and I mean he well one of Jesus' strategies for dealing with potential threats uh, before he makes his way south to Jerusalem to the cross is he just creates distance so he'll just go across the other side of the Galilee with his disciples and the crowds will follow him there, and he'll he he actually plays with the different districts of the different Herods, so he got out of uh, that particular I think that's. Herod Antipas you're talking about he got out of his district and went to 
uh, district of Philip in the northeast of the Galilee. But anyways, um, just to create some space and let things cool off because it's not his time. He's, he's timing his departure. But uh, um, yeah, that, that's, a fascinating, that's a fascinating account, the, the beheading of John. Because Gerard illustrates that in contrast to the resurrection of Jesus, doesn't he? You know, the idea of the false resurrection of John versus the real resurrection of Jesus. Did you touch on that in the book here? Uh, I, I, think I, I think I discussed it somewhat. I mean, I, there, there's a chapter, the, the third chapter is dedicated to Gerard's treatment of the gospel account. And I, and I discuss his approach and his insights uh, pretty thoroughly there. And when I walk through Mark's account, I, I do talk about how John the Baptist is kind of, he's, he's really a forerunner of Jesus in almost every way, right? Like he comes before him, he's captured before him, he's, he's sacrificed ritually prior to him. I mean, he, he's a forerunner of Jesus, not just in his coming, but in his, his death and the, the, the reason for his death. He's, he's a scapegoat as well. And, um, and uh, yeah, but I'm, I, I, I don't recall commenting in depth on the significance of Herod's fear of his resurrection, although that does it, obviously. Yeah, I think it adds to your thesis just from what I've heard, what you've presented today, because it, you know, it, it supports your thesis because, you know, Gerard's saying that, you know, he's, he's got, that's an example of the false, you know, mythic culture, you know, the idea right. that a spirit could come back and get revenge on you because you sacrificed them, you know, and, and there was a problem with people all over the ancient world were worried about that. You know, that's why they would offer sacrifices in the building of a new city, you know, with a murement as a way of offering a token to the other spirits to like satiate them. So they wouldn't get, uh, you know, vengeance on them or curse them. And so that's in total distinction from the real resurrection of Jesus, right? Which is all about shalom and, and forgiveness and, and nonviolence there, right? Yeah. And and the leaders of Israel respond differently to Jesus, where their their solution is to tell a lie, of course, to cover up their to say, well, his his disciples stole the body. And uh, and so it's it's an actual cover up of an astonishing historical fact, the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, so yeah, it's it's completely different. Um, yeah, that, that's a fascinating observation about uh, Herod's fear of John's um, resurrection. But that's and, in the, you know, that, that's in the combat mythic frame of of thinking, you know, that the spirit yeah. could haunt you, you know, and get yeah. you in revenge. Yeah, and and in, and in that satiation episode that that follows a scapegoating, there there's a desire to. As I understand it in myth, there's, there's typically a desire to, um, you know, before the scapegoating of the victim, he's a malefactor, he's a threat to the community. But after, after he's been killed and dismembered, and and then his, like if it's a literal human sacrifice, but even if it's figurative, there are ways you can achieve this figuratively, like with the divvying up of Jesus' uh, clothing and things like that, even in the crucifixion account. But there, there's a sharing around of the, like the, the malefactor becomes a benefactor and all of his or her or their parts are divided amongst the group of scapegoaters for their benefit. So there's that factor as well that, that takes place that Jesus undermines as well. Um, and he, I, he turns on its head with the Eucharist, right? The, his, his Lord's table is a subversion of, of that feast on the victim and it, it takes on a, a, uh, an antithetical meaning um, for Christians thereafter. What is that antithetical meaning in contradiction to the mythic culture view of, because I think well, we do, if we're not literal cannibals, we cannibalize people all the time in the way we treat people at work and the way we do political stuff, the way we do always wanting to devour their being, right? Consume their otherness, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah, I, I, I think this version of it, I mean, there are a number of aspects to it. One is that, um, you know, as Apostle Paul would write, Christ, our Passover has been sacrificed. And if I'm not mistaken, he's writing about that in the context of, you know, like any writes in Galatians, uh, if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. 
the for for the Christian, there is one final sacrifice that was made, and that's the cross. And we we remember that, you know, Christ said, do this in remembrance of me with, with, with the Lord's table. We don't continue to sacrifice victims because we consider there to have been a finished work that Christ achieved. So we, we are done with that. That was a thing that we did before we believed, before we understood, right? Before we um, were, were converted or, or changed by this truth. And, um, so I think that's how that is undermined is there's a cessation of the, of the pattern that comes about with the acceptance of the revelation. Could you, could you touch on a little bit about the difference between the mythic resurrection stories of myths that you studied in this book versus the resurrection that happens with Jesus? How, why are they different structurally a little bit? Well, in the combat myth pattern, there I don't know that there, there, there's no resurrection in the combat myth pattern. I know that there are resurrected gods in various, but like, so, so for example, in, uh, in the myth of Zeus versus Typhon, Typhon is ultimately near the end of the pattern, Zeus defeats him. He, he casts Mount Etna upon him. And so he sort of encases him in the earth and that's it, right? Um, Zeus has reestablished uh, Cosmos on the corpse of Typh Typhon, who's entombed, and um, and that's it. I, there's no resurrection of Typhon and Zeus himself. Well, okay, so maybe I've maybe I've so that that that's the monster. Zeus has a moment when he's captured by Typhon, where he's he's not killed, but he's uh, debilitated. What, what, what Typhon does is he, he takes him to his cave, he removes his sinews, <laughs> takes away his strength, and, um, and, and some, some other mythological gods have to come and uh, release Zeus from that cave. So it's a figurative uh, death and resurrection for him there. We have like Horus, um, right? Horus is a dying and rising god that... Right. Yeah, and so there's... So Gerard says that the rising God aspect is the psychological effect that you're talking about there, right? Satiation, the idea that, wow, this person's spirit lives among us now. They must have been a God. I mean, we're going to have to remember them because they solved the crisis for us right? by us devouring it, right? Is that where that comes from there? Yeah, I think you're right. I think Gerard observes that, and, and there are various vestiges of it in the wh whoever becomes the head or the, the focus of the power of a culture will be said to be possessed of the, of the genius or the, the spirit. I mean, obviously for, for the Romans at, in the first century, every, every Caesar is, you know, he, he's a son of God. He has the spirit of, there's a reason he's called Caesar, right? I mean, that, that he was sort of the, the victim that founded the Roman empire in a sense. And so they're all called Caesar and they're all, they're all gods by virtue of that. And they're all, possessed of this uh, ruling spirit. So, and there are other cultures that did similar things. So uh, if, if that's what you're referring to, yeah. And that's, and that's but, but that needs to be repeated. And that, that sort of spirit of this hero is passed on through, through the continuation of the cycle. And that's. Um, so, so it's not so a it's bodily still, resurrection that's reported as a historical thing. It's more of a symbolic spiritual return kind of thing right yeah it's it's not literal which is also a key distinction of course for for christianity which is it's the literal bodily resurrection of christ that is the basis of our faith and if as paul says if christ did not rise our faith is in vain do you believe um, that the pagans believed lived the literal reality of those different god stories or do you think they saw them as kind of like symbolic representations of maybe a real spirit or something but they didn't take all the details so literal do you have That's any opinion on that? I think uh, they, I, I think pagan peoples of the ancient world, and yeah, I, I think they believe their myths. And I think they, yeah, I, I think they believe their myths. And yeah, wanted to participate in, in the victory of, of their God. And so they, they 
and, but but you're right that their participation in it is really it, it's it's indirect it's not and that that's an interesting thing to think about is well in, in my opinion they believe there was an historical event which is that what, what 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 the myth recounts but then there's a way that we live in light of it as members of that myth culture where we benefit from what they achieved in an indirect way and um yeah and that's yeah i suppose there are some parallels to christianity in that except for that um christians anticipate and maybe this isn't so well <laughs> christians anticipate a bodily resurrection because of christ's resurrection right right um so we anticipate a physical restoration of things right. as a consequence of that historical reality as well just as just as historically as jesus resurrection was our future one will be right and um i i it, this is this is an aspect of things that I don't I don't dig into in depth in Jesus and myth because my main focus is like I I, I try to be very fo focused on just the one argument that Jesus that is Jesus life is recounted in the Gospels in conformity with myth's pattern or not and establishing that in in, in the narrative account and in and in his social behavior and. Um, but these are these are fascinating angles that that Gerard spends more time on than I than I do in Jesus and myth. Yeah, it, it, I, I I like this quote from uh, an article from uh, Sir Dasgupta. He's quoting um, an author named Rodney Stark. He says um, it was not that he's talking about the difference between Christianity. He says uh, they. It was not that Romans knew nothing of charity, but that it was not based on service to the gods. Pagan gods did not punish ethical violations because they imposed no ethical demands. Humans offended the gods only through neglect or by violation of ritual standards. Since pagan gods required only propitiation and beyond that left human affairs in human hands, a pagan priest could not preach that those lacking in the spirit of charity risked their salvation. Indeed, the pagan gods offered no salvation. They might be bribed to perform various services, but the gods did not provide an escape from mortality. We must keep that in mind as we compare the reaction of Christians and pagans to the shadow of, of sudden death. Hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. The fact that, uh, the the mythological gods are are capricious and and like one one thing I talk about in the book in the introduction I think is uh, the early church fathers were were engaged in debates with their pagan counterparts to distinguish to on the one hand distinguish Christianity from myth but on 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 the other hand to defend against the charge that Christians were were somehow um, atheists or you know people who who were beyond the pale and uh justin martyr in his uh, i think in his first apology writes about similarities between jesus as a son of god and all the sons of zeus of jupiter and he talks about how in in greco-roman society uh he writes it's an honorable we all know it's an honorable thing to imitate the gods yeah but the, but but the gods' behavior, like you say, is not it's not like they are models for for compassion or or charity. They they have a certain pattern, and it has to do with, um, you know, sacrifice of the other for for my benefit or for our benefit or our family's benefit. And and that's the imitation of the gods that that is practiced by those who succeed in myth culture. Right? They want. They want prosperity and power and prestige and position and all the things that the world gives through sacrifice of the other. And it's, yeah, it's not the value system that, that Christ taught and modeled. It's exactly the opposite. Right. And that's the, that same, what the gods modeled in the past or what nations and ideologies and politicians and celebrities model for us today. You know, it's yeah. the same collective delusion of grandeur that, 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 yeah. that dominates what they do in terms of how they set out to be a role model for us to imitate. Uh, yeah. The resurrection of Jesus creates schism and division, whereas the the dying and rising myth gods, they create unity. 
a consensus that yes, this was a good thing and we should keep this going. So right. there's there's a very there's a there's a rupture that takes place with the resurrection of Jesus, which I think I think you know is an apologetic to the historicity of his resurrection. The fact that it follows on an inverted way, as you show in this book, so many of the, the different patterns of myths, but that it doesn't end in uh, everybody agreeing that that person needed to be scapegoated. And it was a great lesson for us that we'll repeat every season. Rather, it creates total violent schism where people are willing to walk away from the religion of their, of, or their, the way in which their religion was understood from their dominant culture and risk death even to do so, you know? Yeah. Yeah. C Christianity engenders a, a, a radical commitment to the truth um, that, that trumps it, 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 it trumps uh, commitment to these uh, social relationships, these social, the, the, the unity of the group. And so, yeah, it, it's fascinating how it does that. Um, and I guess that's, and I think Gerard cites Jesus words concerning this when Jesus said, I haven't come to bring peace, but a sword, right? Which I think you were quoting uh, some uh, passion, uh, a passage close to that earlier, the father against his son and, and the mother against her daughter and so forth. And um, yeah, there, there, there's a higher commitment to truth <laughs> um, that, that Christianity uh, brings about. And myth is defined by its, its, uh, it's defined by everyone buying into a shared delusion, and um, when when that when that's dispelled, then uh, what what is going to be our source of unity after that, if if there is one? And uh, the the answer given in Scripture, I think, is the body of Christ, right? That and that's what the church is: is the the invitation to enjoy peace that doesn't pass away because it's established on this finished work of the cross. And, um, and we can have peace with one another um, that, yeah, that doesn't require continual sacrifice of another. Um, and so, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's throwing a wrench in, in, in the gears of that machine of the sacred and just crippling it once and for all. But it requires I guess, it, and, and it's always, you know, Christianity differs from many religions in, the, in, its, in, that, in its emphasis on individual choice, right? I mean, you cannot be, you, you can never be forced to be a Christian. It, it's something that an individual must choose. And, um, and then even once Christians have, when people have chosen to be Christian and, and to, to put their trust in what Christ did for them at the cross, they... Um, <laughs> I mean, we know church history is characterized by this fracturing of denominations <laughs> right. where, where we still have um, caught this and, and the, the wars between the Catholics and the Protestants and the, and uh, the, yeah. I mean, but, you, that, but that's kind of like the legacy, but that's, it's not, it's not what Jesus intended it to be, but he, he predicted right. it would be that way that, that his movement would be a very schismatic sword, like, uh, force of nature through history and that so that even in the era of, of always sch having schisms and denominations, it's doing so because of the emphasis on individual persons that yeah. the gospel engenders in history such that people feel like they have the pride to say, oh, I'm going to break away and start my own church. Whereas in the pagan world, they didn't have that kind of do it yourself deal, you know, <laughs> in that, yeah. in that way. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, yeah. Yeah. The, um, the, um, I don't know if I want to say the exaltation of the individual, but just the, the fundamental value of the individual is, uh, it, yeah, that, that is like you say, is at the heart of the, the divide between the, the pagan and the Christian and, I call it the personhood revolution of Jesus, you know, because it, right. it's the yeah. birth of personhood in its proper way, right? Yeah, and our, and our you know, our, our constitutions enshrine that principle. In fact, they're, they're setting about a description of, like, setting up walls of protection around the individual is what a constitution does, right? And that, yeah, yeah, that's amazing. 
well, and doc- terrifying. Yeah, it is. <laughs> uh, Dr. Barber, we're going to have to leave it here, but it's been a real fascinating discussion. I think we're going to have to do some more of these uh, and, and, and unpack some more ideas together. I really appreciate what you've done. Where can people find your work or stay in touch with you for those who want to further pursue what you're doing here? Well, uh, so uh, you can come to uh, togetherinchristu.com. So this is an online platform I've started uh, to uh, share the book as well as other things I'm working on. And it's on that principle of the body of Christ and the the welcoming message uh, (laughs) that that we were talking about. So that's togetherinchristu.com. And um, there's links to, to pick up the book there. But, of course, you can find it on Amazon. And you can find it on the Whip and Stock website for those who want to uh, pick up a review or a desk copy, if, if that's their interest, um, then they can do that there as well. Well, Jesus and Myth is the book, and it's the gospel accounts, two patterns. And it's a very interesting subject, very timely. I think, I think it provides the foundation for further development of theological and uh, I think even apologetic arguments uh, for Christianity in this anthropological line that, that you've worked on here. Absolutely. I think so. (laughs) Thank you so much, David, for having me on. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Take care.